For every functional economy, you need trading. Without traders, you don't have any price discovery, you don't have any exchange of assets. Your bitcoins will be completely worthless because you will never be able to sell them. It's a Bitcoin only product. This was very important for us. No one is really trying to remove this risk when trading. Are you a Bitcoiner or not? The time where money was just raining everywhere. You need to be really, really careful with not breaking anything on Bitcoin. What are DLCs? Today we cover a topic that I usually uh, like and never covered actually, uh, DLCs. Uh, and probably that's the reason why, because I am a hodler, like I don't trade, I don't do anything like that. <laughs> so it's a, a topic that's a little bit far off uh, my personal realm. But I thought like it's still an interesting topic and it's still like a Bitcoin topic in, in general. And my goal with the podcast is like to have the widest range of Bitcoin guests on the podcast. So I also have to invite people that are maybe a little bit outside of my personal uh, experience. So let's get started with the question, like what are DLCs and pretend that, that I'm five years old and I don't understand anything. <laughs> Good. Well, to explain DLCs for a five-year-old, I guess you must be a really smart five-year-old. But let's go one step back because you, you addressed an interesting topic about hodling Bitcoin. And I, I went to a talk from Yuri. I forgot his surname. I'm sorry. Uh, Cypherpunk. Um, he gave a talk about derivatives trading at Bitcoin Dev the Hack Days at BTC Prague last year. And he started with a bold statement and said, Trading is retarded. <laughs> and I think many Bitcoiners, particularly holders, are related relating to that. They say, no, I'm not trading, I'm I'm hodling. But the thing is that for every functional economy, you need trading. Without traders, you don't have any price discovery, you don't have any exchange of assets. Your Bitcoins would be completely worthless because you will never be able to sell them. So you really, really need the trading part. And um, anyway, maybe we go into that a little bit later. To answer your question, what is a DLC? A DLC is nothing else than a, a technology which enables you to build contracts on Bitcoin and they are enforceable on Bitcoin. So for your five-year-old, if you um, have a toy and the other one has a candy and you want to exchange that, you say, hey, you can play with my toy if you give me your candy. Usually what happens is you take the candy and then run away and you never, never hand over the toy. But with a DLC, with that contract, you can ensure that the rules you set out in the first place are really executed so that you hand over your toy and you get the candy at the same time or nothing at all gets exchanged. And how does this get insured? Is there like a third party involved uh, that handles that or is it on the Bitcoin blockchain? Like how does this uh, work? Yeah, exactly. So there is a third party involved, but it's an independent third party. And that says that um, it's a bit hard to relate to the example we just had, but it just says that an event happened or it didn't happen. Uh, let's just say for this example that you cannot eat that candy without <laughs> having a hard time coming up with a suitable example. Uh, you cannot eat that candy without knowing a certain piece of information. And the Oracle, which is your kindergarten uh, teacher, she will just say, all right, um, this event happened. You have the candy, you can eat it now. And the other party can use the toy. And only if she does that, it's actually usable. So in a more technical sense, it's an, um, a signature which you need to be able to use whatever you receive. And with that, you like, let's just make myself a, a, an example. So I fully understood it. Like, let's make like two uh, people in the school. They're like, uh, let's bet five candies each uh, if it tomorrow rains. And then they go to the uh, teacher. They give both the five candies to the teacher, to the independent party. And then when tomorrow it actually rains, the one says it rains, the one says it does not rain. And then the one that uh, said it will rain uh, actually gets the 10 candies uh, of both of them and uh, both don't have the possibility to back out because the candies are already with the teachers, with the third party uh, side. Uh, is that, did I understand it right? No, it's exactly not that way. So this independent third party doesn't have any knowledge nor access to your funds. 
So if if the two kids are betting about if it's going to rain tomorrow, what they do is they lock up both the candies somewhere and they say, all right, we can only take it if the teacher says it actually rained or it did not rain. And the teacher actually doesn't even know about the two parties betting it because it's somewhere in the drawer and they need they need the secret from the teacher. So there is no no other third party really involved in that um, in that bet. Maybe you can do a very, very simple, a little bit more complex for a five-year-old, but a more realistic example is a coin flip where you say, all right, you, Robin, say heads, I say tail. We lock up our money in this multisig where only the two of us have access to it and only both of us can either spend the money or none of us. And then what we do is we create two transactions from it which are not yet spendable um, one transaction says you get all the funds um, or the other transaction says i get all the funds depending on whether it's heads or tail and then there is an oracle which is a third party service and all it does is it 24 7 asserts to coin flips maybe there's a, a coin slip every hour or every minute and it just says all right coin was heads coin was tail and it publishes signatures and then what we do is we can unilateral, so completely independent from each other, take that signature to that event and put it into our in one of those transactions, which then becomes valid and then we can spend it. Mm, this makes uh, a lot more sense now for me. <laughs> Thank you for giving this example. <laughs> uh, and I think we have now a, a basic understanding on DLCs. Yes. Uh, let's get because you triggered uh, you you mentioned it before like uh, trading and a lot of Bitcoin hodlers actually say that there's this uh, thing where like trading and then it gets to retarded because you can resample the there's a bit I think a really famous meme in in the Bitcoin community. Um, maybe there's like a little bit of a also disconnect between like day trading, short term trading, and just like trading in general because what I'm doing in in with a podcast, we can also say like it's a kind of a trading because I give uh, a value with a podcast in a video form and the others give me time. With the time, they might spend something on the sponsors or on the YouTube links. In that way, I get indirect money for that. Like everything we are doing is kind of a trade in life. Like, <laughs> everything is somewhere a trade. If I, I give someone time, I give someone uh, money. With, with no trade, obviously, we don't have an economy because everybody is not doing anything with each other. So that's 100% uh, right. Um, but like, I think a lot of the people are like, okay, I just want to have my Bitcoin and maybe exchange it for uh, later, like just buy something with it, which is also a trade, uh, but it's like not a not a short-term uh, trade, like, oh, let's bet uh, like 50% of the net worth on some outcome tomorrow or something like that. Um, let's get a little bit in that topic. What do you think of, of, of that? Or like, do you also see the disconnect the the difference between short-term day trading and long-term trading yeah there's totally a difference and i think the the related terminologies are trading versus investing obviously you can then say there's short-term trading or day trading and then long-term trading um i guess most hodlers are more on the investing side of things they invest in bitcoin and they hold it for a long time and sell it or if even ever going to sell it or borrow against it in the future. Um, and then there are the day traders who try to make money out of um, the, the Bitcoin volatility. Then So there are those who really like to take risk. They think they know how the price moves and just take some money. Um, but there are also the conservative ones who'd like to protect themselves. And those are most of the time overlooked and I think they are very, very interesting. Because, for example, a, a business like a miner, it has to pay for electricity and it has to pay for the machines and maybe employees. But the Bitcoin price is volatile and they cannot immediately spend those Bitcoins or they don't immediately have the rewards. So what they should do is they should take the Bitcoin they have and hedge it, get a downside protection against the, bit, the US dollar price so that they can pay for the um, the upcoming bills. And that's that's basically nothing else than shorting Bitcoin with a leverage of one, or maybe even a, more, a higher leverage, but you're shorting Bitcoin to be to get a downside protection until a certain price. Uh, and this is 
I think there are a lot of things you you can do. I was before Bitcoin. I was actually in the stock market and I mess around a little bit with, with shorts and long positions with, with stop things and stuff like that. I was not successful with it because I did not understand it also fully. <laughs> just to be very transparent. Uh, and for myself, it's just like, uh, like for me, it's like I'm, I'm saving in Bitcoin. I see it as my savings account and then we'll try to just provide value and get money from, from that side. But obviously there are a lot of use cases for that because there was no use case for it. Obviously then nobody would do it uh, long term. Um, for the DLCs, what, like, um, what do you see as like the most broad use cases that people will do with it? Like, what are they like the the mainstream use? Case? Obviously, nothing in Bitcoin is mainstream because Bitcoin itself is <laughs> not mainstream. But inside of the Bitcoin community, inside of the DLC uh, community, what what are the like the, the biggest use cases uh, for that? That's a good question. Um... I guess if you go really, really abstract, <clears throat> the biggest use case is betting, betting on anything. It could be um, sports betting. It could be betting on the event like prediction markets. Uh, it could be political events betting. Uh, but it could also be betting on financial products. And that's basically what trading is. And if I think there are only two main companies out there who are building on DLCs right now, and that is Atomic Finance who's building covered called options and now also put options. Um, and thus we build derivatives trading. So in atomic finance use case, they offer users to generate a yield on top of the Bitcoin. Um, while in our case, we enable users to trade Bitcoins without having to leave the safe haven of Bitcoin. So if you are uh, to, to go back to your questions, I think the most common use cases to use DLCs today are trading and it's either yield producing products or derivatives tradings with our tools amazing and uh because you mentioned it now like what, what is actually derivative derivative trading i have a hard time understand <laughs> saying that as an austrian uh and and what is the company uh you're doing it's like one ten ten one finance right this as you have it on the t-shirt also yeah well thanks for pronouncing it correctly most people say 10101 or 10101. <laughs> well, it wasn't the best choice. Um, 10 10 1, the, the number is the binary number for 21, as in 21 million Bitcoin. And we picked that name because non custodial is for us the most important thing. And we want to solve the problem of removing counterparty risk of trading. And when we started, that must have been like, I think, two years ago. Um, there was no other asset on Bitcoin. I mean, there was counterparty. But besides that, there is no possibility to have any other assets on Bitcoin besides Bitcoin. So if you wanted to build trading solutions, you have to build derivatives. And a derivative is a financial product, which, as the name already implies, derives the value from or the price from a certain product. So in our case... We offer Bitcoin USD derivatives, which derives the price from the Bitcoin to USD spot trading. And differently said, you can bet on the Bitcoin price against US dollars, but it's settled in Bitcoin. So if, the, if you say, um, I want to go long against Bitcoin, you bet that the Bitcoin price goes up. And if the price goes up, you get more Bitcoin. Same as if you say um, you go, the price goes up, but the price goes down, you lose in Bitcoin terms. Uh, what we do concretely is we build a non-custodial trading solution for users. So that means that you can trade out of your wallet without having to trust your counterparty. So you don't have to send your hard-earned money to an exchange or um, to an escrow uh, or in that multi-sig. It's literally just you and your counterparty and that's it is that one step closer to we are coming to the world where everything is built on bitcoin like there's like the base layer of bitcoin and we're trying to like just uh, build the financial system now as you say self-custodial on bitcoin dlcs on bitcoin is this just one more part of building the traditional financial systems also on bitcoin yeah totally that's our very very long-term vision to have a financial economy without a centralized authority. 
and you can build the whole stock market on top of Bitcoin so that you can trade your Tesla, your Apple shares and settle that in Bitcoin. Is, is that a f like, um, I often talk about like Bitcoin will be the base layer of everything uh, and 50% of all the interactions we are doing because 50% of every interaction is money and if Bitcoin becomes actually global reserve currency, global reserve money, then it will be 50% of everything we are doing. Um, but when we are now coming to the stock market where we like have a huge system already built <laughs> where the SEC and everything is involved, like there's a, there's a huge market for exactly that. Will that also come on Bitcoin somehow tokenized uh, on Bitcoin or can some of the traditional system be still there, but we are building Bitcoin just as money as an a hybrid system. How do you see like the future of, of Bitcoin, like maybe a little bit long term uh, and uh, displaying out? That is a really good question. Now the, now the, the question is, what is Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin the asset or is Bitcoin the blockchain? And I'm referring to when I say Bitcoin is actually both. Bitcoin is an asset and it's a blockchain and the blockchain is a settlement layer. So what you can do in the the most Bitcoin maximal way is you settle only Bitcoin transactions where the value you transfer is Bitcoin and there are certain security assumptions if you would settle something else. That's why there are the hardcore Bitcoin maximalists would say we don't want any token. But basically you could settle anything. And we have seen the in the recent weeks the, the rooms and ordinals and other NFTs which are also just settled on Bitcoin. I think this will come more and more. Um, block space is expensive, so there will be certain ways to abstract it and move it onto layer two. But Bitcoin is the the most secure decentralized settlement layer, and I see no reason why we wouldn't settle anything else than just Bitcoin transactions. Like, why wouldn't we have a public record of our properties in there, or why wouldn't we have our um, uh, company shares the stock market onto it. I think it just really makes sense to have it really on there. Maybe not everything on the main chain, that might be too much, um, but on another layer on top of it. Yeah, I mean, this will the free market will take care of it because main chain will be really expensive at one point uh, and not every application will be able to even do that economically on the main chain because now, of course, you can do it because the, the costs are like bearable. But uh, like try to figure out everything, put it on the main chain and the fees are going high up and uh, people will be priced out. I don't know how many people and institution can transact on a monthly basis with each other, maybe like 10 million. Uh, realistically, that's uh, it's hard to figure out the number, how many institutions and people can actually do it. Because at some point you will have the lower end user and he will be priced out by someone new coming in and outbidding him. And then they have to move up the, the ladder. Then there's also UTXO management uh, coming in because when you have small UTXO, all of a sudden might be possible that in the future you don't you, you cannot move your Bitcoin anymore. But uh, that's a whole other to topic. <laughs> you should not get into <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, uh, let, let's let's focus on on, on Bitcoin. Uh, like ju just to be clear, like this is only a, a, a Bitcoin product. Like you don't uh, do anything with altcoins, or is the altcoin uh, aspect to it? No, it's a it's a Bitcoin only product, and that's, this was very important for us. We did in the past, so we, we started with cross-chain atomic swaps and enabled users to trade without counterparty risk from one chain into the other. But we learned that most Bitcoiners, they don't want to leave just safe haven. They want to increase the Bitcoin holdings while trading certain assets, like, for example, um, trade the Ethereum Bitcoin pair, which is also quite volatile. Um, but you don't, they don't want to hold Ethereum because... It's a whole different um, risk assumption to hold Ethereum, which might or might not fork again or do whatever they do. So we said, no, we need to build something on top of Bitcoin where you are in your in your safe haven. And yeah, derivatives are the, the only way. So we are a Bitcoin only product built on Bitcoin for Bitcoiner. How would how's this? Um, this Pampers guy in, in German TV from Bitcoiners inspired for Bitcoiners created. You know what I'm referring to? <laughs> uh, I've, 
think and uh, no, like uh, for uh, for babies know, exactly. so from babies inspired for babies created. That's oh, what yeah. saying in German. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one, yeah. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. Why did you actually choose to, to work in Bitly? Like, how did you come into the, the, the Bitcoin uh, sphere? I think it, you uh, listened to the Stephen Levera podcast you did. I think it was uh, early on uh, in 2014 or something like that even. Yeah, so I got into Bitcoin. I heard about it quite earlier. I'm not claiming that I understood anything until like maybe 2017 or so. Um, but I lost money at Mt. Gox and that really branded me. I I, I remember that it was like, um, so what do I do now? Who do I call? <laughs> Where do I get my money back? It was just just gone. And I mean, it, it was honestly my own fault because I kind of understood this non-custodial aspect of Bitcoin already, but I wanted to trade at the same time. So it's similar to you. I have a bit of a trading background. And it's just natural to keep your money somewhere on an exchange or a bank or somewhere where you want to trade. <laughs> it's just gone. So I thought that this is just a big scam. Um, I'm not going to use it. And But I got then back into it and said, no one is really trying to solve that problem. No one is really trying to remove this risk when trading. And I think this is one of the most important problems to solve because if you believe in Bitcoin and if you believe in non-custodialness of Bitcoin, you should also trade non-custodial. You should not trade custodial. And every everyone who says the market for non-custodial is too small, I'm going to be like, are you a Bitcoiner or not? If you believe in Bitcoin, then there is only non-custodial trading. Everything else is you're trading IOUs. You don't trade Bitcoins. And I think that yeah, it has a huge business opportunity, huge market, and it's still a hardly solved problem. Yeah, and I think we are like we are in Bitcoin really early, and then products and services and companies on top of Bitcoin we are really early on, uh, because uh, all, for, first you have to solve the protocol and and get this the protocol in in people's head, and then you can uh, make other things. I just a quick question. I heard from Mt. Gox that people are getting their money slowly back, but I don't know. I never researched deeply, but maybe because you had exposure. Do you know more about it? Do, do, do you get your money back? Some of it, yeah. So you could, or you, you're getting some parts in fiat and some parts in Bitcoin. Don't exactly ask me how much and what the exchange rate was. So it's not, not good. Um, but I think they started paying it out already or it is um, on the go right now. I haven't received it yet, so. Yeah, yeah, I think it's... But I, I heard it like half a year ago that they are paying it back, which be, which is interesting because these were like forced hodlers. 
but honestly, <laughs> you only get a small percentage back, or like there's maybe you don't get anything back. Let's see how it all uh, plays out long term. Um, what do you, you think? Also get Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash back. Sorry, you also get Bitcoin cash back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's interesting but Bit, like bitcoin cash was not mount gox before bitcoin cash wait uh, yeah yeah I'm but since saying, you yeah. since you hold bitcoin at the time of the fork they basically doubled the coins and you have a, a claim on this bitcoin cash how did you live through uh, the the whole Bitcoin Cash scene? Like you were there uh, in 2017, uh, and you hold held Bitcoin in that time. How was that uh, a period of time for for you in the Bitcoin sphere? <laughs> that was an amazing time. It was the time where money was just raining everywhere, token airdrops and ICOs and forks. Uh, we had Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV and Bitcoin Gold and Bitcoin Private and I don't know what else. And the hard part was you just have to dump it as fast as possible. <laughs> Otherwise, the price is going to crash. <laughs> but it was definitely an exciting time. It was fun. Do you foresee that we get uh, such a bull market again? I feel like the 2021 bull market was not as crazy. Like we did not have the craziness of, of 2017. Uh, 2021 was a little bit more calmer like i don't know like, it was not that uh exciting there was not this massive upswing in price all of course tesla elon musk there was some drama in there there was some some nice things in there then there was later celsius so there there was some stories in there of course it was not boring uh, it's never really boring in bitcoin but the craziness of 2017 i feel like there was not that massive thing do we do, do you think we get that in that bull run? Was that like a little bit cut off of the last bull run because uh, there was like this China thing and, and so on? No, I think the answer is regulations. Like 2015, 2016, no one had an idea what is legal, what is not legal. And then when 2016, when the ICO started and 2017, when it peaked, there was already rumor that these are unregulated securities and you had to be very careful in how you, you name those, this token and what you promise. But it was still the wild west and people did just whatever they want. Then um, later on we had, what did they call it? Exchange issued tokens or something. Exchange issued offering token offering or something. So was not an ICO where you had to buy in, but the tokens were dis distributed and you had airdrops and all kinds of things. So they, they always try to get around this, the the regulations, but it's getting harder and harder and it's or it's getting more clear on what is legal and what is not legal. And that probably slowed down the, the 2021 bull market, but it was different. Like 2021 was the, the lending and the yield farming where... You, it was also possible to get money from everywhere and people just tried to add decentralization on anything. <laughs> Let's just put it in a smart contract and call it a decentralized thing. Uh, but we hold the private keys and we can upgrade it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the next bull market will be L2s on top of Bitcoin. We saw the hype already in recent weeks with um, op. Well, what was it? Cat VM and Bit VM and then um, Citroen or whatever. There are different L2s who are trying to build some CKP verifiers based um, layer twos on top of Bitcoin. They will all try to create their own sidechains, have their own tokens, and same same idea as an ICO again. Get a token and dump it on retail. Is there, is there uh, for you uh, the, one of the most promising layer tools is Lightning or do you see some other solutions uh, coming up to like, because there are a lot of problems with Lightning, some other like others more, some think like Lightning will be, will be the clue that has more of the highways where the other la layer tools or layer threes are connected with each other. Like how do you see the, the scaling solutions then to, to Bitcoin? Hmm. Yeah, I guess we need to agree on what is a layer two. And I 
I'm of the opinion that in layer two needs to you need to have the possibility to unilaterally exit it, meaning you need to be able to get in and out of that L2 without having to ask for permission. And everything else is something else. <laughs> it could be, I mean, is is liquid and L2? I don't know. To some degree, I think you can get in um, without having to ask for permission. But if you want to get out without permissions, you need to do an atomic swap. Otherwise, you have to go through the functionaries or the, the validators, and they need to sign uh, the transaction and release the money. These promised L2s, um, they, for example, those who build on BitVM, they, I think, they are optimistic in the sense of. You can get in and out, um, but you still have some form of, um, what is it called, a sequencer or something. So you still have some centralized party on top of it, which needs to ensure that the whole thing functions. Most of those L2s, they need certain opcodes, uh, maybe opcat, the most simple one, um, or some transaction covenants opcodes. And I think if we get those opcodes, we can build completely different stuff i would i think the last thing i would do is build a l2 in the sense of ethereum l2s where you have an evm complete side chain which is a whole new blockchain because you have all kind of different problems like for a starter evm is in my opinion completely broken and insecure i mean it's been around now since 10 years but it's still it's javascript and i don't want to write financial products in javascript uh, but on the other hand, you you have another blockchain on top of it. So you need to produce blocks and then you need to build some consensus algorithm on top of it. Uh, maybe add proof of work on top of it. <laughs> it was like, this does not scale. That's not a proper L2. So why don't we use some more complex opcodes to build something on top of Bitcoin? And I think that's where um, CatVM wants to get into with recursive transaction covenants where you basically enable arbitrary executions on top of Bitcoin, similar to BitVM. You were also uh, a coder, I think, if I uh, got, it, got it right. Like you were in software development or are you still developing software? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you might hear it where I talk. Yes, I'm definitely a coder at heart, yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm coding actively every day. It's, it's fascinating for me because... I have a hard time uh, talking with software. I, I'm also software developer. Like I, I came from that scene. Now I'm not doing it anymore. I did it like for three and a half years, like full time on in a company, uh, back end and front end. Uh, so I know it, but I'm not good in it. That's why I stopped it. <laughs> I'm just not the the, the best coder. Uh, um, but for me, it was always interesting when I talked with coders. The often have a hard time understanding Bitcoin. There are a lot mm -hmm. of things that uh, a coder does not initially uh, understand about Bitcoin. Like, first of all, like, of course, the whole um, finance side of it, like you don't, you have to understand money also to understand Bitcoin and not just the technical stuff in it, but also that Bitcoin is not moving as fast. Like as a coder, they has like a one or two week sprint where they're like, developing new stuff it's always new features uh, fix bu uh, bug fixing and stuff like that but in bitcoin you have a working systems and you don't want to touch it too much <laughs> the, the, if you want if you touch too much the base layer you might have uh, you might break it um how was it for you to get into bitcoin with the coding mindset was this helping you or was it maybe even uh, bad for you no i can totally relate to that um i got into bitcoin from a technical perspective and I appreciated the, the distributed system side of Bitcoin because I was studying distributed system technologies. And I thought that, whoa, so all of this stuff, what we are learning right now from Byzantine fault tolerance to peer-to-peer -to -peer messaging that can be used in a tool, which is basically money. I mean, I don't understand money, but <laughs> the technology was really cool. And uh, so I definitely got from the technical side of things in there and I don't want to, but I think I have to admit that I, during 2016, 2017, I looked to the Ethereum side and was like, these guys are moving really fast and they're building so much stuff. That is cool. But it took me a while to realize that you don't want to move fast. You want to be safe. You want to be secure because 
Bitcoin is just more. And if you accidentally break it, then we don't have another chance. Like if we need to fork Bitcoin because we broke it, then the biggest promise of Bitcoin is broken. We changed something. And so we need to be really, really careful with not breaking anything on Bitcoin and really, really careful with adding stuff on Bitcoin, which could make the whole, the, the base use case, could change the base use case. So I'd, is there any, yeah. Uh, is there anything if you like, if you would be the god of Bitcoin, is there anything you would actually change or is is uh, is there is it perfect as it is like would you integrate anything in the the base layer protocol that you're like okay we we should have this small update or this big update in, in bitcoin well i would love to have some form of transaction covenants with some form of transaction covenants maybe of cat or um ctv or i don't know what the others are out there we can build quite a bit and we actually were building on top of liquid for some time where we built some some form of non-custodial lending where you put up bitcoin as a collateral and then you get a stable coin as a loan back and all of this without without counterparty risk without having to ask for permissions and this was done with opcat and object sig from stack and if you get this on top of bitcoin i mean things will be quite pricey because you need to put a little bit more data on chain but you can build so many more use cases yeah and i uh, had a um, discussion with wicked uh, i think two three episodes ago uh, where we talked about uh utxo management uh, where we need when we want to scale utxos and self-custodial on main chain uh, we need to have some way of sharing UTXOs, maybe even with like 100 people or 200 people or 1,000 people. Uh, and uh, that needs to, to have, there seems to be the consensus that something might change in the future and this is might be necessary to actually scale Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm always careful with, with uh, promoting uh, change on Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, it seems to be the CTV. I, I heard a lot uh, that people really like it, uh, and yeah, let's let's see what happens. Uh, and uh, I think Bitcoin is so strong, and especially 2017 uh, proved that point where the whole industry basically was against Bitcoin and was for Bitcoin Cash with the miners and a lot of uh, famous voices also in Bitcoin back then. Uh, and still the users, the nodes decided otherwise and uh, Bitcoin uh, lived on as, as it seems because the free market decides what actually has value and what not. So it's an, an interesting interesting um, industry to just be in, uh, observe it and, and be uh, an, an player in the, in the sphere. Um, you have uh, also probably moved to Australia at some point uh, because you said that we are now in, in Australia and, and you come from Austria, uh, I think. Uh, and for me, it's interesting when we look at the whole world and why people move. Uh, and for me, it's like a lot of Bitcoiners are now moving to El Salvador. Um, maybe like, like what's your thoughts on El Salvador and then like why uh, Australia? Probably this was before El Salvador was Bitcoin country. Yeah, I mean, Australia was a, a very personal choice. I came here in 2012 during, uni during my studies as in an exchange semester. And I just love, love this, this big island. It's just beautiful. I love the outback, the, the middle of nowhere, the nothing. Um, but we actually wanted to leave Australia last year, or we left Australia last year, and we explored Latin America. And I was also in El Salvador. And I could feel that there is there is a certain movement in El Salvador. It's it feels it's definitely feels safe, but I think the jump from a very very developed country like Australia or Austria to El Salvador is a very big one, and you might underestimate that it's gonna take a few years, if not even a generation or two, before. El Salvador is deemed to be a really secure country and the corruptness from it. You, you can't just remove it tomorrow by exchanging the top of the leader. I mean, isn't he currently um, 
uh, watching his own team um, suing them for corruptness or something. So it's it doesn't change until tomorrow. The feeling, the passion was really cool. It feels like a very young startup where everyone is pushing in the same direction. They believe in the same thing, but at the same time, it's so fragile and you just don't know where it's going to end. So if you're an yeah, it's early investor, it might be good to invest in there and see if you can take something from the upside, but I'm um, a bit more careful. I mean, El Salvador uh, started from the bottom, right? And it's literally one of the worst countries to be in. Uh, and uh, they had a lot of problems before that. And now they try to move up. And uh, there's a lot of question marks and also long-term viability because they have to prove also that the things that they are now moving in the right direction can move long-term in the right direction. Like, it's easy to steer the country for short-term. It's really hard to do steer the massive Uh, direction and from a country in a, in a completely different uh, direction. That's uh, it's really cool uh, to, to see and to observe. Uh, and I want to uh, visit there this year uh, because I had like 10 people, I think, already on that were in El Salvador or uh, moved to El Salvador. And it's uh, fascinating to see kind of everybody has the same feelings about it. It's like a, a, a country startup. <laughs> uh, I hear that a lot. <laughs> Uh, from El Salvador and yeah but uh, let's come uh, closer to the end of the podcast uh, before we get over to the end of the end routine of the podcast what are you currently really passionate about uh, or studying because I think like Bitcoiners are really interesting people they are like uh, studying and learning uh, every day something new or they're trying to get some something uh, um, a, a new topic um Besides Bitcoin, besides the topics we touched on today, is there anything you're really passionate about uh, currently? <laughs> um, barbecuing. <laughs> I bought myself a, a Kamado Chao, a smoker, which is like this gigantic beast. I don't know if you have seen these things. They look like a big red egg. And you can cook everything on it, from your steak to your rose to your brisket but you can also make pizza and bread and desserts and it's it's a whole science to look into that i i mean i'm currently trying to optimize my steaks <laughs> still early there <laughs> but that's 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 a that's a whole skill to optimize for uh, really really cool uh perfect then let's come to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest Uh, and it's a question that we a little bit touched on, uh, but maybe there's some some new thing in there. Uh, is there anything that will be significantly different uh, in this new Bitcoin cycle than the last one? Yeah, um, I think we're gonna see big money trying to influence developers, Bitcoin developers. So we, I mean, we have seen. I think they pulled back um, some some ETFs. Who said they're gonna fund um, so Bitcoin developers? And then I think that's Michael Saylor said, "Don't do it." Maybe they pulled it back. I'm not sure, but we we get the urge to change something in Bitcoin, and with money you can influence people. And I think it will be hard to see whether people are driven by passion and think it's the right thing to do, or because they are driven by money. And in the past. It was definitely more the cypherpunk movement, but we are now in a stage where big money is being moved and big people are depending on this. There might be the move of trying to change stuff just because they they have the money. Uh, definitely, and it's, uh, in, it's an interesting uh, field to be in. Um, before we uh, end, uh, where can people find you in the best way? Uh, and especially, like, is there anything you want to add to, to today's podcast? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I always have to shill our own product. Uh, please give 1010 <laughs> a try. If you want to trade, if you want to bet on the Bitcoin price, 1010 you can find under 10101.finance. Um, myself, you can find on all major social networks on that Bonomat, also on uh, Noster. I'm not going to read my public key, but on this Bonomat, you will find me on Noster as well. Um, yeah. No, it was fun, fun being with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for taking the time. It was a pleasure talking with you. And I think it was a 
as a topic, a new topic that we never uh, covered on, on, on Bitcoin with the DLCs. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the feedback. And uh, as always, uh, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you.